OK. So when I said we were going to be covering ethics, I think based on what I did with the Cambridge Analytica stuff, it was just kind of me talking and ranting and bringing up interesting questions. I want to prepare you all a little better than that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about ethical frameworks. So, um, yeah, I need that thing. Cool. First ethical framework that I'm going to talk about is utilitarianism. Basic idea behind utilitarianism is that you want to maximize the net happiness of everyone. You add together how much happiness uh, everybody gets, and then you subtract all of the sadness. Now, how do you define happiness and sadness in this? There are several different ways. Um, some of the more common ones are pleasure. You're trying to maximize uh, how good some, everyone feels. Um, it can also include utility in, uh, based on the notion that a productive person is a happy person. It can include eudomain, eudomain. It sounds almost on the slide. I cannot pronounce it. Never took Greek. Uh, basically, the idea behind that is uh, civic duty and responsiveness, or uh, ability to contribute to society positively, and all sorts of things like that. Uh, you're probably rather familiar with utilitarianism, so I will move on now if people know it's good. Another uh, important approach to consider is egoism. Uh, strictly speaking, uh, what Rand wrote about is a combination of ethical egoism, rational egoism, and uh, psychological egoism. But ethical egoism, at the very least, means that the right thing to do, or the morally correct thing to do, is what will maximize your net happiness, pleasure, utility, however you define uh, good for yourself. With the idea being that there is no one you can trust to look out for your own interests better than yourself. You can't possibly be corrupted into a way that you are not acting in a way that is rationally self-interested in your own goals. And if everyone is doing what maximizes their own thing, that means everyone is working towards something that is good. There's no one that's ever going to be used as a mere means according to this because the other person should be working towards their own positive. So if you tried to use or abuse them, they would stop you. Um, I admit I'm not super well versed in this school of thought, but I did try and uh, cover as best I could. And there are a few more detailed slides on here that I'm not presenting, but are on your handouts and are on the file or in the file. Uh, so you have some more details. But I want to cover the basics for everybody. The next ethical framework I want to talk about is theory of justice. The big reason that I bring this up is because a lot of people think of ethics as, oh, it's some long dead idea that, you know, after Aristotle and Plato figured it out, or Jesus fixed it, or the Enlightenment thinkers did the great stuff to America. It's thought of in the past. But it's still an active field of development. There are new ideas coming out of ethics and questions of, what's right and how do you define what's right are getting new perspectives and answers. And uh, the guy up here, I think it's John Rawls, Rawls is the last name I know, is probably one of the more famous recent people uh, to work on kind of a field shattering idea in terms of ethics. Uh, he came up with, uh, go ahead, grab, uh, handout, an index card, and a D10 that I will need back at the end. Okay. Um, Rawls's major contribution was 
asking, when was the last time anybody thought about justice? And the answer is recently, all the time. People constantly think about it. So the entire court system is centered around. But then he said, that talks about retributive justice or uh, some other frameworks of what justice means. It's about punishing people or trying to figure out what an appropriate solution is given that someone has done something wrong. Rawls instead goes back to ask, well, let's figure out what justice means from the perspective of where does it come from? How did every society in the world, in the history of the world, develop some notion of justice? And why is it that across all of them, there are some traits in common? So he proposes a thought experiment. How can you define fairness? You can define fairness by saying, what would everybody agree to if we were in an ideal world? If there was no inequality, if no one had ever done anything wrong, if everyone had the same opportunities, the same abilities, the same uh, strengths, weaknesses, everything, everyone was capable of doing everything. In this society where everyone knows and agrees what's right, because everyone can have the same opportunities and experiences, what would that group do? What would someone there do when confronted with someone breaking a rule? And he goes a step further in saying, not only is everyone equal, but you also put a veil of ignorance over the situation. So you don't say, John stole Sarah's sheep. You say, someone stole something from someone. So you're only looking at the relevant question. Now, the intuitive answer might be they come up with all sorts of crazy nonsense. But he adds an allowance that these people in this perfect and ideal society do have knowledge of our flawed world. So they know wow, if we let people do this, then slavery happens. Or, oh man, did you know that when people have low blood sugar, they're more violent? Or things like that. So they have this factual knowledge, but they are all equal and detached from it. And the theory of justice is all about what would happen in that perfect or ideal society. How would they react? What would they suggest as what's right and wrong? I suppose one other recent development in ethics is uh, something that Karl Popper came up with. Uh, it was a, he came up with a variant of utilitarianism or a flavor of utilitarianism called negative utilitarianism. Uh, negative utilitarianism is instead of trying to maximize happiness, good, pleasure, whatever, it's minimize and then reduce harm is your goal. Only once you've done that can you consider pleasure. Because Popper, he's just like done absolutely everything and transformed so much of the world. But he had the, he noticed the trend in history that when people are looking out for trying to say, well, let's do the most good, Oftentimes that means, well, let's just exterminate the people that carry this bad genetic thing. Or let's say, kill the, that rich guy over there, steal all his money, then no one's poor. Or, hey, these poor people can't stop me, let's steal all their money. And are they behaving ethically? They found ways to justify it. But they all have the product of increasing harm even though you could argue there is a net increase in pleasure, even when subtracting the harm. So that's what happened there. Sorry. Karl Popper, very important guy to everyone who does science anything. Um, but he also has this fun philosophy stuff. Um, so far, I've talked about one of... Uh, one of three kinds of ethical systems. Um, 
which I just blankly. Uh, and three kinds of ethical systems. Uh, virtue ethics, deontological ethics, and uh, God. It's not called principle ethics, but uh, ethics that has kind of the frame. I know it is on the next, it's on the slide right after utilitarianism. Sorry, uh, I bumped. Anyway, the second flavor is deontological ethics or rule-based ethics. Rule-based ethics are systems of ethics that have things are right and wrong based on following a listed set of rules. What is right is when you do what the rules say you should do. What is wrong is when you uh, do what it says you shouldn't. Um, this is a pretty common framework and even amongst other systems, a lot of them use these kinds of deontological rules as a rough heuristic so you don't go and evaluate, well, do I pull the lever on this track with the trolley on it or is it okay to put your fat man out of the track? Like, so you don't have to go through the process of weighing everything all the time. You instead just fall back on a set of rules or rough heuristics that are guided by your principles. So it's not like there aren't rules in other systems of ethics. It's just these start with rules. Rules are the kernel behind them. Um, so some examples of this that you might have heard of are the Hippocratic Oath. So first, do no harm. And then a bunch of other stuff that doctors today don't actually do, like a ban on surgery. And you, you have to live with your patient. For, it, it, there's lots of weird stuff in the original Hippocratic Oath. It's funny to look up if you read it at some point. Um, but it's a set of rules. You must do this. You must not do that. You may not perform surgery. You may not give your patient a poison. You must um, provide for the life needs of your apprentice in terms of food, housing, and clothing them. Some other examples. If you go on a website, there's terms of service. They say on this website, you may not upload sexually explicit images. You may not make posts that are hate speech. Those are the rules. What is right to on that website is following those terms. And kosher or halal or many other religious uh, strictures have some sort of, you may not mix milk and uh, dairy and meat in the same dish or you must honor your mom and dad, or any of an array of things. The point here is the rules are a set of what is right and wrong, and that's what you follow. The reason that this becomes tricky or has any discussion is rules don't cover everything. You need to figure out how to interpret the rules. I'm now going to move on to Kant's categorical imperative. I just bring it up as an example of deontological ethics. In truth, I don't really think it's that popular anymore. It's just one that you're probably going to learn about and is simple enough to understand. Um, so Kant has, at the very top, there is a single rule from which all ethics flow, according to the categorical imperative. You should act only in a way that is consistent with what should be done in the most general case. And what does this mean? It's similar to the golden rule. A lot of people have trouble with what's the difference. But the golden rule is do unto others what you have to do unto you. The categorical imperative says, no, you need to generalize. So is stealing wrong? Yes, stealing violates the categorical imperative. How does it do that? Well, if I steal bread to feed my family, it might seem like, oh, I should be able to do that. But no, that's the same as any other stealing. If everyone is allowed to steal in any situation, for any reason, then the concept of property ownership is meaningless because anyone can take whatever they want. If property ownership is meaningless, then how can you steal? So you couldn't have instigated it. You've created a paradox. 
is it okay to lie to a crazy person holding an axe covered in blood that says, I need to see your friend about some teeth? And you know your friend is hiding behind a couch. Are you allowed to say, no, I don't know where my friend is? No, you may not. Why can't you do that? You can't do it because if you can lie to this person about this thing, then anyone can lie about anything. If anyone can lie about anything, then there is no such thing as truth. If there is no truth, then you couldn't have lied. It's self-defeating. Now, there were a lot of criticisms even in Kant's time about this. And he acknowledged, no, I obviously would not actually tell the truth to this hypothetical murderer. He frames the categorical imperative as something that works if everyone obeys it. It does not work when people deviate from it. Or it can wind up in situations where it doesn't work if people deviate from it. So this falls under a set of ethical principles that requires universalism to apply. Universalism means that everyone must be following the system for the system to work properly. Um, there are a number of things that are like degrees of how much universality is in it, but this is one that can really fall apart without. Eventually, Kant went on to say, yes, that's what my categorical imperative is, but the real insight you're supposed to get out of it once you apply it across a lot of different situations becomes, do not use people as a mere means. So you cannot do something to someone else merely to further another goal. It has to benefit them in some way. Um, and that could include they consent to it. So you, you, you cannot impose a cost on them. You cannot harm someone. And, but if they agree to it, then it's not harming them. So yes, you could take someone's kidney to donate to someone else if they're cool with it. Um, but yeah, can't use people as a mere means. That's kind of how most people will look at the categorical imperative now. And last of our ethical frameworks, I want to talk about virtue ethics, the third big family of ethical ideas, or ethical frameworks, meta-ethical frameworks. There we go. Um, both Confucius and Aristotle came up with it independently, so there's different Eastern and Western traditions on this, but the underlying ideas are people suck, you want to not suck. How do you not suck? Well, you envision or imagine your ideal self. What would be the ultimate me? How could I be a perfect citizen or a perfect father or a perfect teacher, then whenever you're confronted with an ethical question, you don't listen to your own wants and desires. You instead listen to the desires of what that ideal version of you would have. What would perfect James do in this situation? And the goal here is to train yourself to act like the less shitty version of you. And it's very much founded on, or it very heavily takes into account the fact that we can cognitively know whether something is right or wrong, and that can be different from what we think or feel or want. And the goal is to transform what you actually think and feel and want at that subconscious level you can't control into what it should be by practice, practice, practice until it becomes second nature, until it becomes what you automatically do. And that's when you've become your ideal virtu uh, virtuous self. A big component of all systems of virtue ethics are that they have some cardinal virtues. Um, something that is considered valuable, honesty, civility, honor, uh, self-sacrifice, avoiding gluttony, things that are part of this ideal you, this ideal person. 
And they have something called practical wisdom, which is learning how to weigh these different things against each other. Because another core insight here is that even these ideal perfect virtues aren't always 100% appropriate. Honesty is a virtue. We discussed most of us don't want to be honest about that to that axe murderer. Well, what does practical wisdom tell us? We need to balance the different virtues against each other. That ideal person has all of these virtues in differing degrees, but what part of what makes them ideal is that they know how to balance and understand the different virtues in such a way that they can make a correct application of saying, yes, honesty is important, protecting lives is more important. Or they can say, protecting lives is, or they can say, honesty is important, but self-sacrifice also needs to be considered. So that's how virtue ethics works in a more general sense. It was kind of abandoned for like 1,500 years, but it got back in vogue a few centuries ago. Um, so that's why I present the big three meta-ethical frameworks. However, we are not in a philosophy class right now. We are in a class in a business school. Because of that, there are a few different perspectives on duty and obligation. And these are a mix of, in some cases, you'll be required by law to act in a certain way. In others, you will be required by a professional society or you'll have signed a contract, or you'll believe one of these is more appropriate, personally, or um, you'll believe a client, or a client that you're working with, or someone you're consulting with, will value one of these differently. So that's why we need to go over what some of these different duties are. The first is duty to shareholders. This is the most straightforward, it's what uh, corporations are required to do in most circumstances. Your goal is to maximize the gain for your shareholders. You are not allowed to consider, oh, but this hurts my supplier, or oh, this other terrible thing could happen, or I bet we could find a way to balance it and trade a little, no. You must maximize shareholder value. If there is something legal that you can do that will deliver more value, you do it. That is the correct answer. Uh, that's how duty to shareholders works. Duty to stakeholders is a broader concept. In many states, I don't know if it's all of them, I didn't have that time to survey it, but in many states, you can instead opt within your corporate governing documents, specify that a duty to stakeholders is more important than a duty to shareholders, or that you may consider stakeholders instead of merely optimizing shareholders. So who is a stakeholder? Obviously shareholders are one of your stakeholders, but so are all of your employees, and so are your customers. So are the people, or your suppliers, so are the people downstream. So are the people you contract uh, subservices out to. Uh, so is the academic community that fosters and trains the people who may work in your organization someday. Um, you're allowed to consider all of those and you are trying to, again, just like duty to shareholders, you have to maximize value, but you're allowed to maximize value for a broader group. So you are allowed to say Yes, we could charge, or I'm, if I'm Pearson, a textbook manufacturer, I could say, yes, we can double the prices of our textbooks. Or with a duty to stakeholders, I could say, you know, we have students there. Maybe it's better for us in the future if the people who read our books, our customers, are able to afford a newer edition. So being able to consider all of those is what duty to stakeholders is.
And the kind of on steroids version of this is a public benefit corporation or a public benefit org or a benefit company. There's a lot of different names for it. It's a fairly new concept within legal structures of corporations. Asterisk. But there, it's an option for this in all 50 states now, or at least one option in all 50 states now, where in the governing document of your corporation, you are permitted to file not as a, you, are st you can still be a for-profit organization, but you may designate that your goal is not maximizing value for shareholders or stakeholders. Your goal is to benefit society overall. And that while you do still ha have to acknowledge a duty to shareholders and are res have a lot of the same legal responsibilities as a typical for-profit corporation, public benefit corps do allow you to say, this is bad for me, but good for the world based on how I define good for the world. Usually in your governing documents, you need to specify, and sometimes even when filing, you need to file into a category. So, but you can do things like promoting wellness in children. I know it's one of the options in Colorado. Uh, you can promote appreciation of the environment. You can, um, you can actually advance the, mm, don't remember what the middle word, eh. You can actually actively promote a religion. So for example, Hobby Lobby, if they were founded more recently, could have, instead of calling themselves an, let's see, I think they're an LLP, no. Whatever, instead of calling themselves the kind of corporation they are, they could call themselves a public benefit corporation and have their goal be, we are going to advance the cause of Christianity as our mission. These interact weird in a lot of different ways, a lot of laws, and it's still new legal territory, obviously. But the idea can be you're helping society, and that's why your corporation exists, even though, yes, you're still making money and paying salaries and not doing all the nonprofit goody two shoes stuff. Um, so those are different people you can have duties to. And now that we've covered our ethical frameworks, and we've covered uh, different people that you can be obligated to or who you're doing it from the perspective of. I want to go through some exercises. We'll break up and talk about this. Um, I suppose first, do we have any questions? I, I went through this all pretty quick and I saw a lot of huh, staring out into space thinking about, I hadn't thought of it that way. But I know oh, we can fall behind if that happens. So are there questions or concerns or anything? Um, also, I noticed, a, I heard a bunch of you clicking to take notes, um, just for your own knowledge. I am not going to be requiring you to know anything from this class on any form of graded assignment. Um, so, I'm sorry, I probably should have said that before we went through all the slides, but, um, that's kind of going to be the thrust of what's going on for the rest of the course. You've had your exams. I'm going to do something about that second exam um, to help you guys recoup some points. But the new material I'm covering from here on out is more stuff that interests me or I think is valuable to you, unless you must know this to survive in the real world. So I'm not going to super care. End of this class, oh. or end of this class or Wednesday, start of Wednesday, one of the two. Uh, so what I want everyone to do is take your D10, roll it twice. On your index card, I am going to want you to write name in the top left, and then Tinder, because the first one we're doing is Tinder, and then either A, B, or C. 
and then whatever number you rolled. So we're going to write these on the card. And does everybody understand how this table works? Okay. So you've been given a d10, a 10-sided die. When you roll it, it will have a number between 1 through 9 or a 0 on it. The 0 stands for 10. You then go and look to the right to see how it lines up. So if I rolled a 2, it would be A, because there is a 2 here. And now I've clicked forward and spoiled it all. Great. So 2 is A, because there's this big old A box right here next to the 2. And over here, I just want your number. So, has everyone rolled their die twice to get your letter and then your ethical perspective? So, uh, yes. Okay. Once we've got these, I would like everyone who is an A to stand over here. Everyone who is a B to go over here. Everyone who's a C, go by the clock. Uh, you should bring your little ethics handout packet thing with you. Okay. A, B. C. Wow, all your A's? Eh, it happens. That's how randomness works. So, what I've got now is look up your number on here. So, if you were a one on your perspective, theory of justice, four, virtue, ethics, seven, categorical imperative. Now, I am about to present a summary of a situation and then I will ask you a question. Within your groups, you are going to discuss for who you are representing. So A is our Tinder users, B are Tinder shareholders, C is government regulators. Using your ethical perspective, discuss the question that comes up after I describe it. Ideally, you will not like literally tell each other what your ethical frameworks are. The point is that you'll have a mix of different perspectives and viewpoints. You aren't going to know how everyone else is thinking about ethics, but you still need to come to a resolution on what you should do and what is right. So, what have I got for Tinder up here? In case you don't know, it's a dating or hookup site app thing where users are shown pictures of people. You either swipe right if you like them or left if you don't. If two people swipe right at each other, they match and can talk to each other. Tinder selects who you see based on a pretty fancy algorithm, but part of it is an attractiveness score that they have derived for you based on how often you are swiped right, how attractive the people who swipe right on you are, and other factors like that. This information is not visible to the users. Um, but they have a, I think it's a four-point scale of how attractive someone is. In the EU, all citizens have certain rights related to data. Those rights include the right to access data that corporations have about you, the right to be forgotten, so you can require that within it's either 60 or 90 days a company delete everything they know about you, and you have the right to correct errors. So if someone has a database of these are people who uh, jaywalked and you didn't jaywalk, they have to respond and correct the information, um, provided you can prove it based on some screwed up court system. Um, all of this also applies to derived data. So it isn't just raw features that you have given them or someone else has given them about you. It also includes outputs of algorithms. 
So, your attractiveness score. It's something that you uploaded a photo, they used fancy math to figure out what your number is. They did that entirely without your input on how attractive you are. They didn't ask, are you hot? So, given all of this, the questions that you guys need to discuss from the perspective of users, shareholders, government regulators. Should Tinder sell attractiveness data to third parties? If so, should you be able, or should a user be allowed to request its correction, removal, or deletion? Uh, for purposes of this, assume we're in the United States. I bring up the EU simply because they have laws related to this and we don't. Um, so there's some idea of what other governments have tried. So now that we've got this, go and discuss. I'll give you about five, ten minutes. Eh, closer to five, seven minutes. I'll give you seven minutes. And then we'll regroup. Uh, I think I'm a poor, the algorithm says I'm a two. 
Let's regroup. So, uh, oh, just got to catfishing. Great example. Um, so, uh, let's start with Tinder users. You think Tinder should be selling your data to people? We're on the fence still. Okay, you're on the fence. Tinder, do you want to sell data to people? Yep. Cool. Sounds like we should sell data. Um, do you think that people should be able to say, I don't want to be on Tinder anymore, get rid of my stuff? Users? It's my yeah. wife's thing to do. Uh, Tinder shareholders? Um, we decided that we can delete the data, but we want to hold on to it for a certain number of days because we don't want to Cool. We're, we're going to hold on for now in case you change your mind. Government, you think that's a fair compromise? Yep. Basically says we're trying to want this people uh, as transparent as the option. Cool. Uh, how about correction, removal, and deletion is not correct. It should be access, removal, and whatever. Uh, how hot are you? Come home. Okay, cool. Uh, can I get a show of hands? Who thinks that uh, he's actually more than that? Okay, so based on okay, you can put your hands down. Cool. Uh, so based on that, it's possible that his number may in fact not really be a two. And maybe, maybe not. Point is. You haven't gotten your access to it yet. But you have a number. It might be wrong. If it, oh, you'll need the die more. We're doing a bunch more of these. Um, so this data might be wrong. What, what should you do about it? Okay, so Tinder's willing to say, you know what, that's cute. You say that, let's uh, put it in this in pile. We'll think about it. Uh, is that a cool solution to you? Is that yeah. good enough? I mean, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's not entirely up to me. I understand that it's a very subjective thing. So. Okay, okay. Uh, government. You you okay with like them just saying, oh God, please don't, please don't kick me off the site. I want to know, I want to be loved, uh, and then just kind of rolling over and saying whatever the corporation does is cool. I feel like it should be deleted until they figure out whether or not it was correct or not. Um, basically, say sure we'll look into it, and tell them we'll like take away your information. So in case it is wrong, and then also the company should have a window of time 
say you have 30 days to get back to you on whether or not it was right or not? Oh, a time limit on how long you can evaluate and reset the user to the unrated level until uh, it has been addressed as either uh, good or bad. I know Tinder does have a, you haven't been rated by enough people, so you just kind of go in this kind of but nebulous. You're not shown to fours, but you're, you can be seen by everyone else. But then that might be really bad, too. If he's been on oh, very true. rated, and then maybe he's not running... So, government, you're trying to destroy small businesses. You're wrecking their model and destroying the world. Why can't you let them compete? The user's fault. Okay, cool. <laughs> Sounds like we've blamed the voters, and that means we're done. Sorry. It is actually regionally. It is regionally based. It's regionally based. Yeah. So I, the big thing, the big patent behind Tinder that made it successful, uh, you guys can go back to your chairs. We'll be uh, rolling up for the next one soon. Thank you. <laughs> Round of applause for someone who is certainly more than a two. Uh -huh. The big thing in Tinder's patent that made them successful where so many other sites failed is they use uh, geolocation information as a core component of all of their uh, matching, attractiveness, uh, similarity, and other algorithms, and they use real-time geolocation data. So I'm a four in this city, but a two in some other city, and it'll treat me as a four here and a two there. Um, and they're just like, no, we, we have all this math done, it's fine. We're doing it based on some mind-blowingly complex network algorithm. Um, it's kind of like K nearest neighbors, except you select the K nearest neighbors to determine what the baselines are for each category, so you're grouping within your clusters. Ugh. Anyway, it's very interesting. The math behind them is awesome. I am sure Bumble is going to lose their lawsuit. Um, Next up, cancer prediction. Uh, everybody roll 2d10. We got cancer. We got A, B, C, D, or E. And then again, our 1 through 10. Dot is uh, bottom right. So there's either a line at the bottom or a dot in the bottom right. OK. So I'm going to want A's over by the fan, B's over by this chair, C's at the clock, D in the back corner over there, E in the back corner over there. So I guess, well, we probably want our C's a little bit further forward, more to the center of the classroom. Okay, so A, B, C, D, E. I need two E's to re-roll. B is over here. Okay. Um. Yeah, it's fine. Um. So, ethical perspective. Who you represent and your ethical perspectives. A's. I'm sorry. You all have cancer. Uh, B. You don't know it, but you're at high risk for developing cancer. C's, you are doctors, presumably oncologists. D's, you're an insurance company. E, you are a prospective employer 
that B wants to work for. So B has filled an application. When you're running your background check, you'll go and ask, how healthy are they? For ethical perspectives, if you are 1 through 5, egoism. If you are 6 through 10, utilitarianism. So egoism, do what is best for you or the shareholder you represent, the person you represent. Utilitarianism, maximize good or minimize harm or something along those lines. So what's, this, what's the background information we've got here? Algorithms exist that can predict what your cancer risk is. The companies that develop these algorithms sell this information to, among others, insurers. Insurers then use that information to cause you to reduce your cancer risk. So they can say, you need to eat better, you need to stop smoking, you need to move away from that power plant, anything like that. They may even know what kinds of interventions are most likely to work. So for something like lung cancer, they might get a recommendation on here is a smoking cessation program that's more likely to be effective. Now, that's all good and dandy. Sometimes this information comes with a stipulation. You may not tell your patient that you got this information from us or how we derive the information for reasons of trade secrets. And also, some insurers don't allow doctors to share the information because you paid money <coughs> to find out what their cancer risk was. We don't want them taking that thing that you paid for and just going to another doctor with it. So they don't, tell pa they don't always tell patients. Sometimes they can. Another group that will buy this sort of information are employers. When running a background check, in most states at least, you're allowed to go and say, I mean, you can ask, are they a Sagittarius? Are they an I INFJ? Uh, what's their work history like? Have they been incarcerated? Um, someone sequenced their genome. Are they going to get cancer? These are all things that an employer can get in a lot of states. However, one thing to keep in mind before we all just say, no, this is terrible, forbidden forever. These algorithms almost certainly would not exist was if there was not a profit incentive. So if the insurers were not making money off of it, if the company selling this data was not able to sell it for a profit, then we just wouldn't have the algorithm to find out, are you a high cancer risk? Can I make a recommendation to stop smoking? I mean, I would generally, but do I push it hard? So it's not an entirely negative, terrible thing. The question I've got here, someone, person B, or our, uh, over here, is at a high risk of developing cancer. A group of patients, including our patient over here, invoke their right to be forgotten. We'll say they did this in a country like Germany, or no. We'll say that this is in Belgium, and they're pretty strict about enforcing getting rid of the derived data. So now you have to train a new model. You're not allowed to use the old models that you had after they've invoked the right to forget. Now you have a new model, one that has less data and is lower quality. Suddenly, these people aren't a high cancer risk anymore. Now, when a prospective employer or an insurer chooses to buy the prediction, what should our high-risk applicant be told? So should an insurer or should a doctor or should the prospective employer tell you, yes, you're a cancer risk? Or should they know, I don't actually know if you're a cancer risk? Or should they say, I don't have to tell you squat? What should they be told? That's what the real question I'm going for here is. OK, five minutes.
that underlies all of this. Do people think that this company should be allowed to sell this data at all? Raise your hand if you think they should. Raise your hand if you think they shouldn't. Okay. Raise your hand if you think that 
this company should be allowed to sell data to arbitrary, eh, eh, let's break it down. Should the company be able to sell it to an insurer? Yes, they should? Okay. Yes, from the perspective of whoever you are. Um, so, should they be able to sell it to an employer? Yes? Should they be able to sell it to a doctor? <laughs> oh, the people who would not die tend to think it's a good idea. So, given that it has been sold anyway, despite all of our reservations and hatred of this nonsense, uh, should the data they sell include they used to be a high risk? Yes, it should. No, it shouldn't. Uh, so let's, um, okay, let's just get a quick summary of what you all came up with because we have to break after this. So uh, people who have cancer and then said, forget about me, I'm tired of using my suffering for profit. What was your conclusion? Should uh, they be able to sell this data? Should they remove well, the patient? What? For egoism, it doesn't matter. Okay, cool. Uh, people who might get their lives saved. Should this data be for sale? Yes. Do you want to have access to it? Yes. Should they be required, any of these groups be required to tell you if they know? Uh, I think everyone should. We Insurance? Don't we don't want them to have it. Oh, you just don't want them to have it at all. Okay. We want to be benefited, not benefited. Okay. <laughs> yeah, reasonable. Um, and. Uh, what do you think about the fact that uh, you're trampling all over these guys' rights? Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Don't give a shit. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. Doctors. Um, for egoism, I said I would not tell them because I'm probably like having like an NDA or whatever it is, and I could send me to jail, so I couldn't probably get it out. Okay. And then yes, for utilitarian reasons, to maximize the patient population. Okay, so it's better to risk losing access to the data for other patients than it is to not tell them. Okay. Insurers, uh, you've bought this data. What do you want to? What do you want to do with it? Are you willing to tell them what's going on, or would you rather not cut into your bottom line? So the idea here is we say, BT Dubs, uh, you're going to get cancer. Here's a brochure for our Cadillac plan. You should sign up now before the price goes up. OK, employers, you guys, when I was over there, sounded really hesitant. You didn't like having this data. You, you think it's creepy and fucked up that any employers do this. But what do you want to do with it now that you've got it? a really important thing in uh, utilitarianism in the context of corporations. If they make more money, that means they can employ more people, which means more people get health care. They can give more money to charity. So yeah, you go under the bus, but it's possible you are increasing net good for doing that. That's part of what negative utilitarianism is designed to combat. Whatever they sell? Okay. Sure. It, you absolutely can make that argument. It's one of the weird things about ethics. You can make any argument. Um, but yes, that's actually a completely valid uh, counterpoint to the argument that by maximizing profits, we're helping people. Uh, egoism. Egotism is slightly different.
exactly. It's, yeah, under the assumption that everyone is going to act in their own self interest. Cool. So we've gone through all of this. We are almost, or we're basically out of time. You guys, thank you. You can go sit down or throw your dice in the bag and then go sit down. Um, <laughs>